What you are about to see has a mechanical gopher in it. The money could have been spent on more of me. Thank you. So I said, look, I'll do the nude scene that goes like, like that, by, on screen. On a magazine, on somebody's coffee table, that's me with my name. I said, I can't do it. You got to give me a fight. Why don't you just let me be? I am the Zen Buddhist that Chevy plays in the movie, kind of a, uh, uh, I'm too lazy to actually be a Buddhist. <laughs> I have been um, unable to eat chocolate since that day because that, I don't know, it hurt me. I don't know why, but. Uh... Do, 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 do. Golfers love this movie, and people say, What's your name? I say, John Peters, and they don't say, You made Rain Man or this thing or Superman or Batman or whatever. They go, oh, You made Caddyshack. Oh, I love Caddyshack. So it's become this kind of classic. Why you got to give me I'm not going to name names, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you, oh, this is, you can get in a lot of trouble for this one. You know, Caddyshack used to be about, you know, the caddies and their shack. Caddies, these uh, other young actors, I, I recall them getting loaded a lot. Myself, Hamilton Mitchell, uh, uh, Michael O'Keefe, we were the stars of that film. And we got lost in the shuffle. Well, we set out to do a movie about, uh, about the caddies and uh, what it was like to be a caddy on a suburban golf course. There have been a lot of complaints already. Fooling around on the course, bad language, smoking grass, poor caddying. If you want to be replaced by golf carts, just keep it up. And uh, in the casting process, we hired such high-powered adult talent, uh, Rodney Dangerfield and Ted Knight and Chevy Chase and Bill Murray, that I inevitably they, it, it, all our creative attention went to making those characters work. And the caddy story kind of didn't fade into the background so much as the, the story of the main caddy really got interlaced. The crux of what this was about, the art of Zen golfing. Stop thinking. Let things happen and be the ball. Harold Ramis and Doug Kenny, who of course were already legend in Hollywood from Animal House, um, and Doug as well from the Harvard Lampoon, so I knew about him when he came out here, um, came in with a 199 page screenplay. And I had no idea what it was. At that time, I was uh, hoping to do a, uh, a very dark comedy about the American Nazi party. And uh, Doug wanted to do a movie about set in the Himalayas, about <laughs> Tibetan Buddhists fighting the Red Chinese. It was never intended to be a comedy. Brian Daw, Murray, Harold Ramis, and Doug Kenny wrote one of the finest dramas ever to be put on paper. It was an yes. epic about the working man. I read somewhere once, I think it was Shakespeare, that some people are born to greatness, others have it thrust upon them, and others are just great, that's all. I started thinking of it not so much as the story of this kid, but as Danny Noonan's um, search for a role model. Mr. Webb, I just got to win that caddy tournament. What do you want to go to college for, Danny? Comedy is always difficult to do, you know, but Harold was quickly a master. First day was a disaster, though. On the first day, we were going to shoot a long speech, which uh, in the finished version of the film is done by Bill Murray. It's the, the famous Dalai Lama speech, where he talks about caddying for the Dalai Lama in the Himalayas. The looper. You know, the caddy, the looper. Jack. And we shot it with another actor. And uh, because I was new to South Florida, I let the production manager, who was a local guy, named Ted Swanson, talked me into using a local actor. And uh, he, Ted said, don't worry, you know, he, he, he's a little funny. I said, what do you mean funny? He said, well, in the Korean War, he, he went through the windshield of a helicopter, and he's never been quite the same since. So I thought, oh my god, I can't believe it. This is day one, like the first big scene we're shooting. 
And it's a long speech, and this guy, he could not put two lines together. He could not remember two lines in succession. And when he did, the acting was horrible. And that's the first big thing I shot. So at the end of the first day, I'm thinking, that's it. They're going to see this in Hollywood, and they're going to call and say, you know, get out. Let's get a real director in there. But as I remember, Harold, the first day of shooting, actually did the first take. And I think Chevy can verify this. He was looking through the wrong end of the camera. This was his first directing uh, job, I believe. I remember going on onto the uh, 18th green or whatever it was, the first place we shot. It was toward, it was the end of the movie. And uh, Harold actually going, and cup, I mean action. <laughs> When you're new, the, the crew treats you with kind of mock respect. They, it looks respectful, but the, and they call you sir a lot, like too much. You start thinking that there's something really contemptuous about it. I love Harold Ramis. I don't, you know, I mean, I just love him. I love Doug Kenny, too. Well, Harold Ramis and Doug Kenny were kind of idols of mine. The great Harold Ramis, revered. I think I'm maybe was the recipient of his first direction to any actor on this earth. I was a violent non-smoker, and he looked at me and he said, Do you know, I never see this guy without an unlit camel in his mouth. I went to three packs a day within two or three days. Whenever I make a film, I think the hardest thing is coming to the set every day, facing the challenge of, of getting something good, and particularly in comedy, because comedy can't sort of work. It works or it doesn't. I want you to kill every golfer on the course. Check me if I'm wrong, Sandy, but if I kill all the golfers, they're going to lock me up and throw away the key. Golfers! They're great kid, not golfers! The little brown furry rodents! We can do that. Hey. We don't even have to have a reason. Funny is, especially in comedy, it's difficult. Words with K are funny. What, are you kidding? Don't go for the joke. What was the question? Don't get the laugh yourself. Set up the joke. My uncle says you got a screw loose. Oh, yeah? Your uncle molests collies. In comedy, there's this intangible that, uh, that you have to like, strive for and achieve every day, and there are no rules for it. It was great um, spontaneity, which was also the hallmark at the time of all the Saturday Night Live people involved. Improvisation, they called it in those days. We always trusted improvisation. We never felt like we were just ad-libbing or winging it. it it's, a, it's an actual technique and a method that allows you to create material. Uh, instantly, and it's not just you know grabbed out of thin air. You actually plan what you're going to do, and you have a, a, a. It's like having a script without finished dialogue. Take one marker. We got to get you a name. I have to think like an animal, and whenever possible, to look like an animal. I'm sorry, I forgot what I was doing. That was a good start, though, wasn't it? <laughs> a lot of this movie was winged. It was improvised. It was extemporaneous. I don't think anything in the script ended up on screen, to tell you the truth. We knew we were funny, you know. Now you back this thing out of here right now! Okay. Hey, look at that! Don't play games with me, Ty! Put that steering wheel over here where it belongs and get this out of here! I got it, Judge. Your audience is kind of the crew, you know, <laughs> or the director. I mean, even when I was doing Saturday Night Live and became f famous for that, for that update thing, it was the camera that I was playing through, and I envisioned on the other side of that camera about seven of my best friends on a couch trying to make them laugh. Bill was so funny coming into this movie because he was really in a stream of consciousness kind of role. His part was not really as big as it turned out to be, but he was on such a roll, they would just leave the camera on him. I guess it's just a matter now of pumping about 15,000 gallons of water down there to teach you a little bit of a lesson. Is that it? I think it is. I think that's my idea. Then we're going to just drown every single guy, guy, guy be dead in water. What do you think about that? that when I first met Bill, he was actually working on a golf course uh, in, in Wilmette, Illinois. He, w he ran the, uh, the food concession on the, on the ninth hole. He sold hot dogs and, and soft drinks and stuff. So I got that going for me, which is nice. In um, one of Bill's most successful speeches in the movie, the uh, Cinderella story, he's uh, talking to himself, pretending he's in the Masters at Augusta. All it says in the script is Carl is in front of the clubhouse uh, cutting the, off the tops of flowers with a grass whip. 
I said, Bill, when you're playing sports, do you ever just talk to yourself like you're, you know, like you're, you're the announcer and you're actually, because I used to do it when I, well, I tried jogging for a while and I used to pretend it was the Olympics and I'd be coming into the stadium. And everyone does this, right? Everyone. So Bill says, I know exactly what you mean. He says, say no more. It looks like a wreck. It's in the hole. It's in the hole. He dropped his. In the middle of the movie, we realized there was no scene between Billy and Chevy. And I went to Mark, who was uh, my partner, and I said, you know what, we don't, the two biggest stars in the movie aren't in the, aren't in the movie together. We knew we needed a scene with me and Billy because we'd been shooting a long time and we just didn't have one. And <laughs> I took the actors off and I think we just sat and had lunch and started talking about, you know, Carl <laughs> growing grass that you could actually play on and smoke at the same time, so. We had lunch. Uh, it was Doug, Kenny, and Harold Ramis, and Billy and me. And uh, this is to my best recollection. And we wrote that scene during lunch and shot it in the afternoon. Chevy would be practicing the night before for God knows what reason. And uh, we would see where Carl lives. They were together one day together, locked him up in a room, and they did all that stuff in the interior. It's like, all right, <laughs> now we're going to see these two guys together. Fine. You know, it had nothing to do with the plot. It was just those two guys being funny. What I love is Billy. Uh, I love him to death. And it's interesting, because Chevy and Bill were not great friends, and they'd had a run in on Saturday Night Live, and uh, it was kind of interesting getting them together and watching them actually work well together. Take two, Mark. Action! You son of a bitch. Where are you? Oh, hi, Carl. Sorry to bother you. Oh, uh, hello, Ty. How are you? Pretty good. Can I play through, do you mind? Sure, yeah. It's uh, getting kind of a late nine, is that it? Yeah, well, greens are pretty busy in the daytime. What, uh, <laughs> missing a ball here? Yeah. Is this your place? Yeah, what do you think? Oh, it's really awful, Carl. It's awful. Well, it's, uh, I've got some stuff on order. It hasn't come in yet. I'm waiting. Uh, wait, awaiting credit approval still. They say assistant greenskeeper means nothing. Oh, yeah. don't, don't listen to that so, stuff. Uh, you yeah. see my ball anywhere? Try list? That's it. Yeah, that's you there. Oh, uh, maybe, uh, can I get a grueling on that? I should probably get a free drop over the shoulder, no closer to the hole. Okay. Well, okay, you go ahead. There. Where is it? But I don't intend to be a greenskeeper forever. I figure, you know, just keep at it six years. I should be the head greenskeeper. I'm studying at night. Look at this stuff. Here. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff people think, oh, he's an idiot. He cuts lawns for a living. You know, there's a lot of stuff you got to know. You know, a lot of strange, <coughs> strange stuff. Chinch bugs. Carl, well, could I get another ruling on that? Because I think it's going to be difficult to. Yeah. I don't want to ruin that coffee Chinch, table. You know, synthesis. You know. Uh huh. Nitrogen. Look at these graphs here. You got to know. Oh, that yeah. Stuff too. That's good stuff, Carl. Yeah. Well, what the heck? Here, sit down. Hey, no, no. I, say I, don't, here? I don't want to stick to anything here. Just if I can. Well, this is kind of a mess. I got a speedy. Yeah. Here, just. No, you know, don't, sit. don't, don't go to any trouble here, there. please. Carl. Salud. No, what? My lips. I don't. If I can get a good lie. Salud. Please. Let me just hold that. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I invented my own kind of grass. You know that? Your own kind of what? My own kind of grass. Yeah. Uh, people think, you know, he doesn't know how to invent grass or something. Look at this. Oh, this yeah. is registered. Carl Spackler Bent. I'll be damned. You know, I've, I've felt this kind of grass before. I've played on this. Yeah. This is amazing stuff. It's a hybrid. Uh, it's uh, Kentucky Blue uh, Featherbed Bent and Northern California Sensomia. The incredible thing is that you can, you know, play 36 holes on it, then take it home and then get stoned, too. I got, a whole lot of, I got pounds of this stuff. Here, keep oh, that no, for yourself. You mean smoke this, really? It's great. Here. Oh, that's great. No, thanks. Here. Hi. I got the big Bob Marley joke. Oh, thanks, here. Carl. You got No, this hey, is, listen. Uh, this is potent. We I just want to take a. All right, that's a quick. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> it's a little harsh. <coughs> cannonball it. Cannonball no. it. Cannonball it. <coughs> Come on, cannonball it. Here, one more. One more. One more. <coughs> it's good stuff. <coughs> it, is <a> little, <coughs> it is a little bit harsh. <coughs> it is a little bit harsh. Can I get a. <coughs> a drop, I'll drop it myself. Well, you should probably get a free drop off there. <coughs> <coughs> right, there you are. That's good, I'll play out of the trap. May I say something to you, frankly? Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you, Carl. You've been acting psychotic lately. Do you know that? I'm saying this is a buddy. You've been acting well, psycho. Well, I, I had a lot on my mind. I've got a whole match of snails tomorrow for money. Judge Smales? I'll tell you something about Smales. He gives you any trouble. Sorry, guys. Hold it right there. <laughs> He's, I've had a, a funny and long relationship with Billy. Uh, we almost had a fight once, and uh, that's why he's so great as a humorist. He's dangerous. But he's literally dangerous. <laughs> you never know what he's going to do. You know, there's a little bit of bully in Billy. We had a scene where uh, Bill comes roaring up to them on a, on a big mower. It's like 20 feet wide, this oh, mower. Uh, he jumps off, and right, he starts giving Ty Webb, Chevy's character, some golf tips, you know. So you're coming back here. You're breaking in around here. By the time you get down to here, see, you've lost it all. And by the time you get down here to your contact zone, you may as well be playing on the ladies' tee, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I'd said to him, Billy, now when I r jump up on the tractor with you, which is what he was driving, yeah, was I've got these spikes on, there, huh? and uh, they're metal, and there's really no place to get a grip. I can't get a purchase on this God-forsaken uh, uh, tractor. So don't make any sudden moves, because the tractor had these wings that were down that were all mowers. You know, I could just be, sh it would be like Titanic hitting the propeller. I think they put it in one TV version of the film because they had to cut the candy bar and they replaced it with this other sequence. And <laughs> of course, we do the scene. I jump up there, sliding around, holding on, and Billy makes the fastest right he can make. I had to jump like 15 feet off the tractor to get missed from getting mowed over. In the same number of takes you would do on a written script, we would evolve a really funny speech for Bill. Same with Chevy. Uh, Chevy would start with the script a little more closely. He was in Second City trained, but he was great at improvising uh, dialogue. And uh, he and I had, it was the beginning of a very good relationship for us. Harold Ramis is such a great director that he gave me Clark Griswold. He helped me invent that character. And with Ty Webb, the same thing. He gave me the attitude. The Zen philosopher Basho once wrote, a flute with no holes is not a flute. And a donut with no hole. It's a Danish. It's a funny guy. Sometimes when I'm playing golf and I really focus on those putts, I do, you know, na 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 We all do, you know. Those things were just winged. And those are the kinds of things that people remember. It's like, na 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 they remember those things. There were scenes outside of Chevy's house, in and around Chevy's house. A lot of that stuff that we shot was improvised. Cindy Morgan, when you want to get involved and cast Cindy Morgan, fantastic. Chevy and I had a couple of scenes. I said, how would you feel about, you know, doing a, uh, playing this, you know, in, without your clothes on? She was very reticent about um, being nude. She said, well, I'd rather not. And I said, fine, that's fine with me. I lied. John Peters calls me and says, you've got to take your clothes off. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, you know, I'm not going to tell her to do that. You know, you tell her to do that. So John got on the phone with her, and he's such a salesman. I don't know what he said to her, but five minutes later, she came out of the room and said, I'm taking my clothes off. So. The, the way you do a swimming uh, scene nude is you keep the water moving. That's the trick. I'd had a lot of brandy that night, so I don't know how cold the pool was. <laughs> I can't tell you, honestly. Just moving your hands a little here and there so that the audience gets just a little a sense of, uh, you know, and of course I had to strap it down. Odd or even? Odd. Odd it is. Your Honor, Your Honor. When I first got there, uh, they were shooting a scene with Ted Knight, who I think personally was the best guy in the picture. He was brilliant. The late, great Ted Knight. Judge Smales inspired me to play golf yeah, later in life. Yeah. His whole repartee in the movie with Ty Webb, with Chevy's character, is classic. Ty, what did you shoot today? Oh, I don't keep score, Judge. Oh, well, how do you measure yourself with other golfers? By height. Ted was wonderful to work with. He was um, extremely affable. Wonderful about you know making me feel I I felt like I was his niece through a lot of the filming. Ted Knight uh, really was like his character Ted Baxter on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. He carried a comb with him and and uh, 20 times a day just quickly you know comb his hair. The the first day Chevy meets him and the first thing I did was rub his hair like good to see you, you know just like that mess it up. He hates that it turns out. <laughs> 
He loved his hair to be perfect. Nice, beautiful silver gray hair. How about a fresca? Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> So I was just like trying to stay alive in this thing. And, you know, and this guys like Rodney and Ted, they were strong, incredible actors. So you stay in the scene or end up on the floor, cutting room floor. What do you say, Al? <laughs> Shall we press on? <laughs> hey, Judge, cheer up, will you? Rodney Dangerfield was a guy that we had seen um, on the Johnny Carson show, and she's on television. He was like a really funny guy. And he had never really done movies before. We thought it would be funny to bring him in and put him in a movie and everybody would love him. Rodney uh, needed every word, every syllable in place, every comma, you know, every period. And I would work with him generally the night before he was going to shoot and we would totally set everything, maybe write some new jokes uh, and get everything in order. This guy, like, I'd wake him up in the morning, we'd put him to bed at night and he was a brilliant, brilliant genius. And of course, Rod, Billy Chevy, all the younger comedians looked up to this guy phenomenally. All right, place your bets, place your bets. Here we are. But you know, I'd say Rodney was a, into being a method actor. He took this very, very seriously, which of course is questionable. But I think that he, um, he brought a whole new level of humor to the set. And um, I, it was a challenge. Hey, Judge, give someone else a chance. Hey, you lucky devil. Hey, honey, come on, relax, will you? <laughs> You're a lot of woman, you know that? <laughs> hey, you want to make $14 the hard way? <laughs> You, 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 you're no gentleman. Yeah, I'm no Don Arby, the you I know. never want to see that man no. here again. They came again. to me after we had shot the film and said, you, you know, we really need another scene with you and Rodney. Now, you may not be able to put this on tape, I don't know, but, because uh, it's so funny. Uh, so it was on a golf course and we're talking <clears throat> and uh, I don't remember what it was, the conversation, but it had been scripted. But as I'm walking away, out of this scene almost to, uh, he says, hey, Ty. I said, what? What, what, yeah, what? He says, what, you know the worst thing about oral sex? Rodney said, the view. <laughs> I just fell over and the whole crew did. And by then we had lost light and uh, the scene was never actually put in the picture. <laughs> oh, somebody stepping a duck. <laughs> and the character they played in the movie was taken after a guy in New York who had sirens on his car, Woo! and he'd go away with police escorts, and he was loud, and of course Rodney took that character and then went to the roof with it. Hey, orange balls, I'll have a box of those, give me a box of those naked lady tees, and give me two of those, give me six of those. Oh, this is the worst looking hat I ever saw. Well, you buy a hat like this, I'll bet you get a free bowl of soup, huh? Oh, it looks good on you, though. This was, I guess, his first film job and I, and I remember he was sitting at lunch one time going am I okay am I okay it's my first movie and I'm going Rodney you're stealing the thing you're running away with it I'll never forget the first day Rodney came to work all the comics were there to watch this guy work because he was the best right Rodney gets up he sees all the comics and he gets that performers energy up and he's delivering his lines and then after a couple of takes he starts to sweat and sweat, and he's upset, and you know, I didn't. I'm trying to figure what the hell's wrong, you know. So I go, Rodney, what's the matter? He goes, Hey, nobody's laughing at me. I'm bombing. I'm bombing out there. And I said, Rodney, they can't laugh at you. He says, That's right, because I'm no good. I suck. And he says, No, no. He says, All those guys out there, all those comics. I said, Rodney, you don't understand. They can't laugh because if they laugh, they can't use the soundtrack. So it's contrary. He thought that he was bombing and all these other comics are there because he was the best. And we were all watching something very special when we were watching Rodney. That kangaroo stole my ball! The, uh, the woodchuck, what do you call it? Woodchuck, beaver, uh, gopher. Gopher? There was no gopher anywhere. We started uh, trying to cast an animal, a live animal. We thought maybe we would do this with a trained a uh, groundhog, a woodchuck, uh, a beaver, a squirrel. We tried every kind of uh, small mammal we could find. At one point I remember a guy with a trained ferret trying to get him to, and the ferret's about this long. You know. 
and uh, none of it was working and eventually we went to something that looked like a mink hand puppet. I felt, and I think we all felt, that the gopher was a wonderful kind of a funny character. I can't stand that gopher. John Peters said, uh, you've got to create this, uh, the world of this gopher, you know. And obviously that was in the days when there was no such thing as special effects. And we went up to, met with George Lucas and ILM and we had the gopher and... They were willing to spend the money, so we went to John Dykstra, who uh, had a special effects house called Apogee. John had uh, worked on Star Wars and all kinds of stuff, and they did the most brilliant uh, creation of this gopher's world. They made these large tunnels. Also, by the way, the gophers play a major role in golf, so one of the biggest problems is keeping these gophers off the course. Do you know what gophers can do to a golf course? Well, it all looked so funny when they put it together, and it really created this uh, very uh, uh, this wonderfully animated nemesis for Bill Murray when Bill's doing all those speeches which we had shot with no vision of a gopher at all suddenly you could see his enemy and it was pretty funny I, <laughs> I have to laugh <laughs> because I've often asked myself by foe my enemy is an animal and in order to conquer him I have to think like an animal and whenever possible to look like one I love him attacking that gopher, uh, making every attempt to get to him, diving. I, I have that image in my mind of him, okay, you know, and then suddenly just diving through the air to try to get that thing. It was always um, funny, you know, I mean, gopher. You think of how rudimentary the effects were in those days. I mean, we worked with John Dykstra, I remember, and if you really look at the handheld puppet, this little gopher that became legend. They spent a bundle on a mechanical gopher that just simply went. And people love it. They remember it. When you see Caddyshack is on, gonna be on TV, you see the mechanical gopher. Who gives a flying fortress? <laughs> there were nighttime golf cart races in the dark, pitch dark, and obviously these golf carts don't have lights. One night, uh... Hamilton Mitchell, Doug Kenny, Hal Ramis, everybody decided they wanted to recreate the famous Patton Rommel tank battle in Africa on the golf course. We broke into the room where they recharge all the golf carts, started them all up. We were running around tearing up the green. I was the one who pushed them downhill. Onto the green, started ramming the golf carts, destroyed the golf carts and we'd have these golf cart wars all around the uh, golf course. And John Barman, who played Spalding, nearly lost his life in one of those crazy little golf cart wars. <laughs> the next morning, the greenskeeper would wonder, what the hell has happened to our fairway? You know, there's just tire tracks all over the place. Yeah, I mean, it was my job to make sure that enough mayhem happened so that Tony and other people could capture this. And, of course, the publicity was a very important part of it. If we wanted it to get all the way back to Hollywood that fun was happening. I mean, it's almost amazing that was only 19 years ago. I mean, 19 being so significant, as you pointed out before, because people often celebrate the 19th year of everything, I'm quite certain, in some country. You got to give me a bite. Why don't you just let me be? It's like a bottle of wine, this movie, you know. Oh, I'm all right. Don't nobody worry about me. I don't know anything about golf. I know that you have to wear golf shoes uh, with spikes. <laughs> I only do cult classics. That's all I do. <laughs> Why you got to give me a fight? Can't you just let me? It was great to see it kind of eventually kind of worm its way into everybody's hearts, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of really proud of it. <laughs> <laughs>
If you're playing golf, be the ball. Hey.